today's event is going to be amazing. So it's called Ontario's COVID-19 Hospital Crisis uh, because that's what everyone's been talking about. We know that our ICU numbers are going up. We know that our numbers of COVID-19 cases are increasing dramatically in wave three. And so we wanted to talk about the ins and outs of all of this. And so we've got an amazing group of panelists here. So we've got Dr. Callie Barrett, we've got Dr. Rewat Dionandan, we've got Dr. Seema Marwaha, we've got Birgit as hosts, we've got Dr. Natib Dasani, we've got myself, we've got Leanne, and then we've got Sabina Vora Miller. As we start this conversation, I just want to say nothing about this session is, is a coincidence or by fluke. It was by design. We titled it On the Brink of Collapse, Ontario's COVID-19 Hospital Crisis. And just to start the conversation broadly, I'm going to start with Callie. You know, um, it, it, it really um, is shocking. You know, right before we started today's uh, session, um, breaking news, um, new modeling here in Ontario will show 12,000 to 18,000 cases a day in our current trend. ICU numbers could be up to 1,600 to 1,800 by end of May. Um, our healthcare system is clearly overwhelmed, Kelly. Um, all the data seems to su suggest this. But sometimes I think when it comes to message, what does this mean? What does this really look like in our ICUs? What does this look like in hospitals? And what are the downstream consequences of what we're seeing? I mean, at an individual hospital level, um, so it, it's actually quite heterogeneous right now across the province. So there are clearly hot spots and regions in the province that are not sort of under fire to the same degree. But certainly in the hot spot regions, what it means is there are literally more patients who need a hospital or critical care bed than there are beds in that institution. Um, the system has been sort of flexing and shuffling patients around a little bit around the province to try to accommodate these these really sick, critical, critically ill patients. So like, for instance, Kingston, their ICU is almost completely full of COVID-19 patients from elsewhere in the province. Um, and so there's also been additional capacity built in the system um, over the past year. But we're now at the point where the number of patients is exceeding not only the beds, but also the healthcare workers that are available to look after them. And um, so this is actually a, a really serious um, point that I don't think actually is fully understood by either the media or the public, because it means, for instance, that the ICU I work in, Toronto Western Hospital, it's a very complex neurocritical intensive care unit. And so our patients need very frequent neuromonitoring. So they need to have their Glasgow coma scale checked every hour and their pupils reaction to light checked every hour and the level of their the pressure in their brains checked every hour. But when nursing um, ratios sort of have to be changed, so that means that like, a nurse would normally be looking after only one of those really sick patients at a time. But I mean, Mike Warner today tweeted that there were something like eight nurses for the entire ICU that he had. So the only solution then in a matter, in a, in, like in a crisis, is to have one nurse looking after two, three, four patients at a time. So what this will mean at an, at an individual patient level is there will be things that will be missed. Um, nurses are already beginning to sort of raise the, the alarm bells that their ability to properly sort of monitor their patients is being jeopardized. That's a huge sort of stressor. It's a huge patient safety issue. It's a huge quality of care issue. That's for the sort of patients that are already in the ICUs. Um, then there's the fact that the patients in the emergency departments, there, there's just nowhere for them to go. They're stuck in the, in the emergency department. Some of them vented, um, in medically induced comas. The emergency departments are not set up to run as an ICU. So that's why patients have been, we've been trying to move them around the province, but there's going to come a point very soon if the trajectory that we're on right now continues where there will not be literally enough beds and healthcare staff to look after these people. And sort of our worst case scenario, everything like our nightmare is that this triage sort of scenario is going to be rolled out, which means we will be making the decision based on a predictor of whether or not someone is has a good chance of survival in one year, of whether or not they get the ICU bed and the ventilator or the person in the bed next to them. And the amount of moral distress and anxiety that this is creating within my profession is like unbelievable. This, this will be the result of trauma and um, people leaving the profession and having massive PTSD and having to change, change their careers because they won't be able to handle the, the trauma. 
it's it's carnage. That's that's really the only word I can describe it. It's it's carnage. I when I saw those numbers for the first time, I I literally cried. I shed a tear because I knew what it meant for myself and my colleagues and my patients. Thank you so much for mentioning that because this is definitely something that I think this session we really want to touch on is the moral injury associated with these numbers um, and how much this actually means uh, to frontline providers. Uh, I wanted to. Um, you know, this first part, we just want to kind of set the stage for everyone. And one of the pieces that you mentioned was um, how we see downstream effects um, in other parts of the system. You know, I work emergency medicine, and I can tell you on my most recent shifts, I mean, I've definitely been noticing, you know, beds are uh, blocked. Um, so when ICU beds are uh, filled, um, that means that we have an inability to uh, transfer patients uh, to ICU beds from the emergency department, meaning we have to move people to other hospitals. And so we do start seeing in the emergency department a backlog um, of, of patients. And so in my job, that's something that I'm seeing. And so um, why don't we actually move to Raywat? Um, Raywat, I had a question for you because we see these numbers and, you know, in your recent Toronto Star article, you stated COVID-19 is not a health crisis, that it's a health systems crisis. Can you elaborate on this? Like, do you think we could have predicted where we're going to get, uh, that we were going to come here? Was this was this something that was in the cards? You know, it's horrifying. You say that article was recent. It was written a year ago this week. A year ago this week. Isn't that wow. astonishing? Yeah, and the way I look at it, what, I was so stupid back then. I thought we knew exactly what needed to be done. Clearly, we did, but we didn't do what needed to be done. So if you look at places like um, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, where they focused on health systems responsiveness to some extent and were able to avoid a lockdown, they still struggled beneath the weight of the pandemic, but they understood that this is a systems level response. When I say this is a health systems crisis, not a health crisis, my distinction is a health crisis, you assume your salvation lies in something like a vaccine. And now it probably does, but it doesn't have to. Our salivation could have lied, or lay, what's the right past participle, lay, could have lay, in just having better responsiveness. Now, it takes you know years to build that responsiveness. And by responsiveness, I mean looking at all of the pillars of a healthcare system. My colleague, uh, Jason Nickerson, tweeted earlier today the framework for the WHO health systems uh, process. And it contains several building blocks. One is service delivery. We have the healthcare workers, information infrastructure, the actual products of a healthcare system like vaccines and technologies, money, and leadership. And each one of those building blocks has a level of tolerance and fragility associated with it. We are reaching the point now where they're all being frayed, in particular the healthcare worker uh, component. Most people think about the healthcare, the health systems crisis here as strictly being one of bed space, physical bed space, or PPE, or ventilators. It's not. It's the entirety of this integrated system. Could we have avoided this? Yeah. Uh, how do we presage this epidemic or crisis by better investment in capacity, scalability, so having more beds per people and the staff to man or staff those beds, rather, um, having uh, a more live vaccine platforms, having a much better information and communications platform and process would be fantastic. Even given that lack of preparation, I believe we're in a position a year ago to hold still until the vaccine arose. And we could have done so by deploying testing at rapid scale and a much better information sharing process to avoid the overload we see here today. So it is frustrating for me to have this conversation, as I'm sure it is for everybody else on this call, because much of this was foreseeable and avoidable. How's that for a crippling uh, opening statement? <laughs> Very, very intense indeed, and I and I love it because it sets the tone perfectly. And I and I want to get right into the meat and potatoes of our discussion here because um, this is what we want to talk about: um, is could we have prevented this? Is it too late? What does this look like? And what are the next steps? I want to jump right into it um, and talk about the perspectives from the front line. Um, so we see these numbers and these graphs and um, Callie, your daily updates are so powerful and you reminded us in one of your recent tweets that behind every statistic is a human life near death. What shocks you most about these statistics? I mean, beyond the, the scale, um, I think they're really, the thing that I think is the most sort of heartbreaking to me is how numb we've all become to these numbers. Um, 
I mean, a year ago, we were freaking out about there being 150 COVID patients in our ICUs, and now there's over 600, and it's just mind-boggling how 600 is now sort of, oh, it's at 655 or whatever today, um, how rapidly just the numbers have become numbers. And I originally started tweeting out the occupancy, not the, the numbers, actually, I was more focused on the daily number of new admissions, because I was trying to highlight that although there were maybe two or 300 patients in the ICU, there were actually, it was the cumulative number of patients who were being admitted on a daily basis that actually mattered from a human perspective. And that 200 in ICU um, on a daily basis is just a snapshot, but over the course of a week, that might have been 600 patients or something like that. Um, and so it's the, the sheer number of people whose lives have been decimated by this virus is, is unimaginable, actually. It's almost beyond our sort of ability to comprehend. Um, and so that is certainly sort of striking. The other thing that, I mean, I have found particularly... I, 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 it's been striking, is that I have not cared for a single white person with COVID-19. And I, and certainly there have been, but they've, they're, every single patient with COVID-19 I've looked after has been racialized. And it became very clear early on that this pandemic was just unmasking the social determinants of health and the inequities in our society. And um, you know, I'm, I'm white. I literally have every single privilege other than the fact that I'm female. And um, I, I think it was a real wake up call for me just how how crucial those social determinants of health were. Um, and it certainly has really sort of energized me and given me a lot of um, <sighs> drive to do more and to do better. Um, to raise awareness to this issue and to help reduce these inequities in our society. Kelly, I mean, that point you just made really, really struck me. I mean, in my work as a social worker in the community, I, I with people who are experiencing homelessness, homelessness, I am seeing folks who are, um, you know, we can argue the most vulnerable, right? With layer upon layer upon layer of, of um, sort of vulnerability, right? And so, you know, when you mentioned that, I mean, it's just so striking, as you said, the inequities that we're seeing, um, it, it's really showing us that more needs to be done. Um, I want to I wanna shift to Birgit. You've been working on the front lines as a nurse, right? And you spend more time with patients really than anybody else, right? And so I'm, I'm wondering... What has been most challenging for you in your terms of day-to-day -day work? And hearing from Dr. Barrett, I mean, that comment mm -hmm. just really struck me. I'm curious, you know, what has that been like for you, Birgit, on the front lines? Um, well, thank you very much. I feel heartbroken. I really do. Um, being an agency nurse, I travel to different hospitals. Um, and during the first wave, I went to a I was... Um, booked at a specific facility. I would not like to mention that. Um, and I saw the population, just like Kali mentioned, mostly racialized people. Um, even when I worked at another facility, um, the demographics, the same, racialized. Um, I've seen PS PSWs pass away. I have seen, um, you know, people in precarious employment, um, pass away. Um, so it has been a heartbreaking experience. And I think the most heartbreaking one was um, we had a patient who literally was dying alone, no family whatsoever in Canada. And the moral injury from that experience is something that a lot of us will have to debrief and try to heal from because a lot went, a lot happened. Um, unfortunately, as nurses, we can only do our best because we're starting to um, see patients flood in. And a lot of times, like I've said so many times, we have seven nurses that are sick and are home and we're working short. Um, so now we're having three patients to one nurse. Um, I actually worked today and um, 
we're starting to hear about five n- patients to one nurse. So I'm like, how is this gonna even be possible? Like, it's not possible. So we're starting to, they're talking about team nursing and all of that. So um, it's just very challenging. And the fact that there's a specific population that's been affected is, is it just really puts the magnifying glass on the inequities in our society. So, um, yeah, very, very challenging. Thank you so much for that, Birgit. I mean, one of the things that I think really struck with me, and I think, you know, Callie also mentioned this, is the moral injury. I mean, I I can't imagine, you know, in my work in palliative care, certainly we see, you know, death after death after death, and it's sort of, we go in, you know, and we're caring for people in their last days, but, I mean, working in this pandemic with COVID-19 and caring for people who are at their last days uh, alone with no family who can be there, or maybe no family, as you mentioned, Birgit, in Canada, you know, just the piece around moral injury really, really, really stuck with me. And so I'd love to ask, you know, others in the room, um, on our, our panelists, you know, can you share a little bit about for, for yourself and your perspective, what, um, that moral injury is looking like, whether for yourself or, or maybe what you've seen on the ground in the front lines. Um, maybe I can start with you, Callie, if you have anything to add there. I, I think one of the the most sort of heartbreaking stories that I will never forget was early on in the pandemic, so last spring, which was a very different experience because it was when we kind of didn't know what was really, we didn't know what to expect, but we were reading all the stories about our colleagues in Italy and New York Um, and there was a man who, um, was in the ICU and we weren't allowing any, oh no, we were allowing visitors, but his, his mother, he was middle-aged and his mother was in her seventies and she didn't want to come in because she was afraid of getting COVID herself. And we had a phone in the room and we were going to palliate him because he was dying. And I was on the phone with the mother telling her that I was holding her son's hand and that he was going to die. And I was holding his hand while he died and that he wasn't going to be alone. And I mean, all of us in the room were crying. We knew that we were providing that human contact for this man while he died through the phone to this woman who was losing her son. And, you know, that, that sort of story was unique then. And now it's just a routine occurrence in every single ICU across the province, across the world right now. So I, I'm th- those are the kinds of traumas that workers are, are experiencing. And I mean, from the family's perspective, I can't even imagine knowing that my son was dying in a hospital bed with some stranger who I've never met before, who I've only ever heard over, a voice over the phone was going to hold his hand for me. Wow, that's super powerful. And um, thank you for sharing that, Kelly. Um, Seema, you've been working on the wards um, and you've been seeing a lot of people with COVID-19. You, you are, you're a lot of things. What I've always admired about you is your ability to tell a story and 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 paint a picture of what it's like. Um, what's it been like for you uh, working on the wards in COVID nineteen? And tell us a bit about your work with Healthy Debate. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that great question. I'm sorry for the tech difficulties. I mean, I guess for me, you know, I think what the numbers sometimes don't tell is that you know, for every patient that's in an ICU bed, there are so many people that are involved looking after them. There's so many people that their admission impacts. And then there's hundreds of patients who are admitted to the wards of a hospital at some stage of recovery um, or escalating COVID. And then there's also hundreds to thousands of people that are at home who are dealing with the ramifications of a positive test. And so if you think about that impact that like bleeds out of the ICU and throughout all of the other parts of the healthcare system, I mean, the impact is absolutely staggering. Um, I think what many people don't realize is that like every flu season, you know, the, the general medical ward is stretched. We have, you know, stretchers of people in many of the community hospitals um, in the emergency department. We have multiple non bed admit dashboards. Um, we look after people in what we call unconventional care spaces. And this is not during COVID. This is just like a regular winter at a GTA hospital. And I think that what's scary about this is that this is going to be sustained. It's already much bigger than any flu season I've ever been through. And it doesn't just touch the general medical ward or the ICU. It touches so many other parts of the system. 
And so I would say that, I mean, the, the ICU, your ICU colleagues, they're the ones that swoop into the general medical ward with their capes when you're stressed out and help you out of a really difficult and stressful situation. And when you see them sweat and when you see their capacity maxed, I mean, it really changes the way you practice because you know that you don't have that support and you don't have escalating care that you can offer the patient that's in front of you. That is such a great point, um, Seema. I'm so happy to have you back in here and also with your perspectives um, from both what you're seeing in the front line as well as from some of that amazing work that you're doing on Healthy Debate as well. So I'd like to switch gears a little over here. And can we perhaps talk about what do we need to do right now um, to get our situation under control? Um, so are, are our current public health measures enough? Should we be doing something else? Will the vaccines be our, um, you know, our only way out? Is there other things that we need to be doing in terms of, you know, um, continued school closures or if there's, um, you know, any other measures that we need to take into consideration. So maybe, um, Raywat, if I could get your thoughts on this, because I know um, I've seen you tweet about some of the things we need to be doing and would love to get your perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to unmute my, mute myself for a second. There's a lot we can do. Now, we're doing some of them right now. I, I know that the government is supposed to announce some new uh, measures today. I was really paying attention about what was actually announced, if anything was indeed announced. But the goal, of course, is to slow transmission sufficiently to give us time to vaccinate. And that, of course, means getting enough vaccines and deploying vaccines strategically. If we weren't in a crisis mode, the original plan to go by age made sense because then you're hardening that demographic that is most likely to be hospitalized. But we are in crisis, and that means you've got to you've got to uh, put the fire where the put the water where the fire is burning hottest. So we need to do several things. Number one, we have to close more things down. I'm sorry, that's true. So a stay-at-home order is great, but it means closing all places of work that are not essential. That also means, of course, that we have to support those people who are economically affected by this. So all this goes hand in hand. We've got to close schools uniformly across the province. This is controversial, but um, you know, I, the way I perceive the epidemiological data, schools are indeed pandemic accelerators, and that's, uh, that's going to help somewhat. We have to have obvious things like paid sick leave, symptom checks, a variety of disincentives to prevent individuals who are likely symptomatic from spreading it to their friends and colleagues and relatives. We have to have rapid tests used more creatively, imaginatively, and at scale. I don't understand this reticence to use rapid testing capacity. It's been used to high purpose and high effect in places like France and UK. The BBC famously tests a large proportion of its employees almost every day. And it's simply a matter of understanding the limitations of the test that determines how well we use them. We have to redeploy vaccines to where they are most effective. That means right now, essential workers in order to keep them, uh, allow them to have society up and running so that we can endure this storm. Now, we only have to do this for a couple of months. The, the harder we act, the earlier we act, the shorter that period of suffering. And the longer we delay and the more tepidly our response becomes the longer the hellacious period happens and the higher the likelihood we have to endure a fourth wave. So I'm fairly optimistic that people are figuring out that this is what we need to do. COVID zero is always on the table as well. And we probably should have pursued that a year ago. I don't think we have the stomach for that right now. We do have the stomach though, I think, for some harshness over a short period of time, probably lasting about two months to drive the numbers down and get shots into as many arms as we can. The great confounder, last thing I'll say, the great confounder behind all this is public tolerance driven by an ineffective communications plan. So people need to understand what the plan is, what the timeline of the plan is, why we're doing it, and when we will join that ramp to normal. So the exit strategy has to be made clear to people, and we're not doing a good job of that yet. There you go. Everyone is agreeing with you. It's like the 100% thing. <laughs> Seriously, I, I've, um, I, I think I've maxed out my emojis for this, uh, for this talk because uh, you, you were so bang on with everything that you said. Um, so... Um, I guess my ne next question, Seema, I'd actually maybe like to, you know, sort of pick up some of that and go into 
vaccines, right? And so we are we are currently in a situation in Ontario where the rollout hasn't exactly been very equitable or accessible. Um, and I know I know you have been very vocal about that as well. And you know you've also said in a recent piece that you wrote for Healthy Debate that um, I hope I wake up tomorrow to a more accessible and equitable system. And so I guess I would love to get your thoughts on both the systemic aspect, but also in terms of how this is playing out in our vaccine rollout here. Well, I, I just want to say thank you for the question, and I echo everything that's been said. I think that the communication strategy, whether it's around vaccines or whether it's around lockdowns, has been incredibly confusing. Like using terms like emergency break and then lockdown and shutdown, and when when they all are sort of you know not full measures, is extremely confusing to the public. And public engagement is sort of what we do at Healthy Debate. And I know you know sometimes you know in science communication we're good at it, and sometimes you know we're not. And I think what's happening now is there's quite a bit of, of public fatigue. Um, and, you know, we really need to have some short term pain for long term gain. And people need to understand not just what they can't do, but also what they can do. Um, so encouraging things like outdoor activities safely um, is another kind of communication strategy that I think is really important. Um, but when it comes to vaccines, I think, you know, my take on it is increasing eligibility is not increasing accessibility or equity. And so if you have online booking systems where you need to open multiple browsers and you need to know exactly what time and date the vaccine appointments are dropping, I mean, that self-selects to those vaccine appointments being filled by a very privileged few. And I think that's what we see happening. Um, you know, it's confusing when you say 18 to 49 year olds um, will very quickly be able to book, you know, in community hubs and then have no details as to how that's going to happen. It opens up floodgates, causes so much confusion and haven't even vaccinated or accessed a lot of the people living in high risk communities who themselves are very high risk. So, you know, I have patients that I discharge from the hospital who are elderly, who are in vulnerable, high-risk communities, and I am physically spending an hour and a half with them in the hospital calling and trying to get them access to the vaccine, and I can't do it. And so if I'm not able, with my best efforts and an hour of my time for family's help, able to get them an appointment, I think we really have a vaccine rollout issue. I also think that, like, we're on fire right now and I walk by vaccine clinics and they're empty um, or they're, they don't seem to be full to capacity. And I just wonder, um, you know, are we doing this per capita based distribution system? Are we not rolling out the vaccines where they're needed the most? But I think what I'm most frustrated with is the lack of transparency. I don't know um, where the vaccines are how they're being used, how they're being distributed. I don't know what's coming when. And when I speak to people who are working on the ground in these vaccine, vaccine clinics, they don't know either. And so I don't know how you're supposed to develop and improve a rollout strategy when you don't necessarily know what the plan is, what the priorities are, and when supply is coming to you. And so there's a lot we have to fix, and we need to figure it out pretty freaking quickly um, because we need to get needles in arms if we don't want to go through a fourth wave. Well said. Um, and, you know, the thing I want to t kind of touch on now is that we've been talking a lot about this big uh, human resource crunch. I mean, we're, we, we're talking about beds and our provinces let us know that um, they're building more beds, right? We've seen these field hospitals prop up um, and they're massive and there's more beds, right? Um, but some people have raised concerns that who's going to staff these beds and um, we've seen reports um, across the gta of hospitals um, that are asking uh, physicians for example to be redeployed into different positions uh, to staff icus or to be hospitalists um, and i wanted to ask um, callie what are your thoughts on that it, is this going to be an effective solution is there more to icu care than just a bed Absolutely. The bed is just the space that the patient goes in, but there's a huge team that supports those patients. So when I work in an ICU, I would typically be responsible for 16 patients, maybe some in the ward as well that we're following and seeing the new eMERGE consults. There's a nurse for each patient, for most of my patients. There's respiratory therapists, each of whom are responsible for between, I don't know, four to 10 patients. There's a pharmacist. 
there's a dietitian, there's a physiotherapist, there's an occupational therapist, there's a social worker, there's a huge team. And you cannot perform or provide adequate critical care medicine with just a physician and a nurse. You need all of those people. And so certainly, yes, I mean, in a, in this crisis, we're looking for service extenders or sort of uh, group uh, sort of team care where there's going to be a critical care physician sort of overseeing a group of, of physicians who are maybe trained in different specialties but have some familiarity. But no, it's not the same. Um, even, even within critical care, there's specific types of critical care. So my colleagues that work at Toronto General Hospital are incredibly trained at ECMO, which is a type of heart-lung bypass machine. You couldn't expect an ICU that has never done ECMO before to suddenly be able to do that well. I, I work at a neurocritical uh, intensive care unit where we, we deal with very complex neurologic um, catastrophes. And similarly, um, some of my colleagues at other ICUs that don't normally see these types of patients also wouldn't be as familiar with the best practices to care for these people. So it's even fair to say one critical care physician is not necessarily trained to work in every single critical care department in the province. So we're highly specialized and sometimes highly sub-sub-specialized. Um, and so, no, this is, this is really bad. The good news is COVID-19 is actually, from a critical care perspective, not that much different than typical sort of respiratory failure for us and ARDS. The, the, the problem for us is the sheer number of these patients. And so, I mean, in, in absent a cloning machine that could make multiple copies of us, really the best we can do is either bring in our colleagues from other areas that don't have the same demands on their system. That's becoming more challenging or ask some of our colleagues that can maybe perform some of the care and then have us sort of provide oversight to make sure that everything is being done to sort of best standards of care. But no, we, there, there literally is a point where there will not be enough nurses and critical care physicians and respiratory therapists to manage all of these patients. And I want to stick with that for a second, um, Callie, because you're painting a, a picture, albeit a bleak picture. Now, I, like I'm a palliative care doctor, and, and and part of the work that I do is 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 inherently providing people with end of life care. And and you touched on the triage protocol early on. There's a lot of folks listening who are curious about that, and many people have not heard about the triage protocol because my understanding is we've we've never had to use a tri triage protocol, at least in recent history. Can you just very briefly kind of just go through the steps of what that looks like and what that will mean for healthcare and people who need healthcare in Ontario? Sure. So I want to be very clear that I have not seen the, what I, what I'm understand to be the most recent version of the protocol. So I'm going to speak very general to what this would look like because I haven't seen the most recent document. Um, no but essentially what it would mean is when you are faced with an insufficient number of resources you have to make a decision about who is the most appropriate person to get the next available resource. And there's multiple ways you could do this. You could do this by just a pure age cutoff, but that's sort of, that's not fair to people who have a very good quality of life who are older and it's very ageist. You could, um, decide that the first person to arrive in the door would be the first, first person to get the next bed, but that's also not fair because the person that arrived first might not be the best candidate. And so the, the protocol that's been developed is, has been designed to try to maximize in sort of a, an economic perspective, return on investment, essentially, to try to allocate that scarce resource to the person who is most likely to potentially benefit from receiving care. And so there are various sort of stages of this, but essentially it would look like you would do a assessment of the person's likelihood of having a good outcome in 6, 12, 18 months. I believe it's a 12-month sort of assessment. And the person with the best likelihood of having a good outcome in one year would be the person who would be allocated to that bed. The person who was then deemed to be a less good candidate for that bed, would then be offered palliative care, essentially, and or the best sort of medical management up to the point where they 
um, the resources weren't available. So I imagine you could get into a scenario where perhaps the patient needed a ventilator. Um, and instead of putting them on a ventilator, you would see how they would do on high flow nasal cannula or maybe just supplemental oxygen. But if it looked like they were deteriorating and they were not going to do well or they were really suffering, then you would initiate comfort measures and so medications to help them feel no pain and discomfort. It's, 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 I, I, I hate even, say, I can't believe I just said that. Like it's, it's, it is literally outside the scope of anything I ever thought I would have to do as a critical care physician. Um, and if it, if it comes to that, like I'm going to need a therapist. I'm, I'm not joking. I I'm going to need a therapist to help me work through the trauma. And I think all of my colleagues in critical care are going to feel the same way. And the nurses and the respiratory therapists, everyone that deals with these patients is going to be in serious need of some therapy after all of this. And that's what kind of brings it back to the piece we spoke earlier about that moral injury. Like, I cannot imagine having to be a decision maker, you know, as you mentioned, Callie, to, to have to choose. How do we do that? How do we put value? Like, who do we choose or prioritize? I can't imagine that, right? And then back to that moral injury. And, um, and you no, know, to be clear, the my understanding is the way that this would work is actually that there would be an independent sort of group of people who would be making the decision. So it would be out of the individual treating physician's hands, which is also good because that would take away some of that sort of trauma. But still, I, I, wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want to be the person on that panel. Hmm. True enough. I was thinking the same. Thank you for clarifying that. And you know what? I was thinking the same. I would not want to be have to be a part of that panel, right? Whether it's the individual physician or if it's a panel of people, I mean, at the end of the day, to have to make that choice would be just so, so difficult. And I'm really glad that you took the time to explain that because I wasn't very clear myself as to what the framework would really look like. So thank you so much for taking the time to kind of break that down for us. Before we shift, I do want to hear, we've been talking a lot about ICU and critical care, and I really, really, really want to pose another question to Birgit, if I may. Um, And, you know, what I'm thinking a little bit about is about this really powerful piece by Healthy Debate that was shared recently. And what it says is, is that nurses need more than accolades. They need to be valued for their critical role and care they provide. And that means fair compensation. And so I want to ask you, Birgit, what are your reflections on this? Because I know that you have spoken up a lot on Twitter and you've had a lot of tweets go viral around your piece when you speak about paid sick leave. Please speak your mind with us right now. We're listening. Thank you very much. Um, Well, number one, we want a nurse and the provincial task force. There has to be a nurse on the table. Um, We don't want people speaking for us anymore. We want to be able to come and also speak for ourselves. Um, In addition to that, um, I know that a lot of um, professions where you have um, critical care specialties are paid accordingly. Um, In nursing, we don't have that. Um, Critical care nurses actually have the same pay rate as any other nurse practicing in any other uh, specialty. A lot of people would argue this. However, I think this is a big deterrent. Um, As a new grad nurse, I remember um, when I wanted to um, 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 choose my specialty, I was debating between emergency nursing and ICU nursing. And some of my colleagues were also debating on which route to take. However, a major, a major deterrent was we are all going to be paid the same way. Why do I have to stress myself so much? So I think we have to start considering how we pay specialty nurses. Um, I think that will be one way to retain nurses in the future. Um, I know a lot of places in the States, they're doing that. Um, and I don't see why Canada cannot adopt something similar. In, in addition, a lot of us, um, especially, ner- I'm speaking for nurses that work through agencies, we fall through the cracks a lot. And over the years, I've been practicing as an agency nurse for about four years now. And hospitals are always short-staffed. They always need nurses. And there's this pool of nurses that come through nursing agencies that don't have the four walls of a hospital to call a home. And as a result, we do not qualify for 
so many benefits. Um, the main ones will be mental health benefits in terms of having the support. Um, we don't have support in any form. So we're asking also for a consideration in this regard. So we want to be um, recognized in a way that we can get the support we need, especially now there are a lot of age agency nurses that are being used to work in different facilities and everyone goes home and there's no support. Um, you can access a manager or a colleague to, you know, just have a conversation with at the end of your shift. So if you're debriefing after a cold blue, um, you go home on your own and you just try to cope. So there are so many things that are not in place as of yet. Um, so yeah, in, in, in terms of um, remuneration, we will want to see more, want to see more mental health support and, and also, we want to we want a nurse at the uh, in the um, provincial task force. Absolutely, such great discussions today. Um, thank you all for being here today with us on Twitter Spaces. Um, the you know we've talked a lot about um, the people who are who are in the ICUs, who are in the hospitals right now. And um, see, my this question is for you. Uh, I've I've seen. A you know, through some of the work that you're doing, you know, using journalism, giving voices, giving, um, you know, sharing stories of people who you've seen um, in your in your ward, in your hospitals. Could you maybe talk to us about, you know, your your role in journalism, the role of journalism in sharing these stories? And, and if you feel comfortable, perhaps even sharing um, a story of someone that has been very impactful to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, before I went into medicine, I was very interested in documentary film and documenting the human experience. And I think it's really, really important. Um, like the numbers, you know, they tell us so much, but after a year of this, we're getting a little desensitized to the numbers. Like, you know, you see 400, 500, 600 ICU beds being filled and it's hard to emotionally connect to what that means. You know, it sounded very, very scary months ago. It still sounds scary now, but sitting at home in your apartment or your house, like how can you connect to what's happening um, beyond the walls of the hospital? Um, there's a couple of interesting initiatives that we've done. So one was called Faces of COVID, where we profiled, you know, healthcare providers and essential workers. Because one of the things that we do in healthcare is we um, take all of the chaos and we turn it into calm. Um, and we're so good at it. <laughs> and so, you know, the ICU, you take this incredibly chaotic situation and systematically and strategically, you take control and you create calm out of chaos so that you can help get the person through. And sometimes, you know, an unintentional byproduct of that is that that drama and every day that's happening, people don't understand, they can't see it and they can't feel it. So I think telling stories is absolutely so important. I mean, there's so many, I'm not even sure, you know, where to start, but there's, there's one man who I profiled for a story in, um, in CMAJ where I do these patient portraits. And he was a man that lived in the same apartment building, you know, his entire life for like 40 years, paid the same amount of rent. And he was one of the people that unfortunately, when the moratorium on evictions was lifted um, in the fall, he was evicted and put out um, on the street. Um, he was 80. He had worked his entire life. Um, he had a pension, um, but he, you know, he just could not believe that he had been kicked out of this place. Um, and then he slept in a park um, for a few days, then eventually got picked up by the police and driven to a homeless shelter and then was in the shelter system for about three months. And, you know, he tried to go to the bank um, to be able to, like, access some of his funds, but he didn't have his ID. When he was evicted, all of his possessions were left in, in the place. He was essentially just locked out. And then slowly, you know, he kind of devolved into, like, he couldn't access any of the supports that he had, you know, saved his entire life to prevent a situation like this. He ended up catching COVID and, you know, came into the hospital and, you know, we were dealing with this COVID, but we're also dealing with the psychological trauma of this man sort of like losing his entire, his entire life. And I mean, you know, there are so many people who we see um, on the hospital wards where, you know, they're essential workers or they were forced to go to work sick or their entire family um, got sick with COVID. And when they leave the hospital, 
um, the trauma and the stress doesn't end. You know, the recovery doesn't end. When people are recovered and they're not infectious with COVID anymore, it doesn't mean that they feel better. You know, the recovery is going to be, for many people, a much longer road than that. Um, and then sometimes I think what we don't talk about are the stories of people who don't have to, don't come into the hospital. Like we assume that people that have COVID that don't need to come into the hospital are asymptomatic. I mean, they're not. I mean, sometimes it can be just as much work to keep someone out of the hospital as it is to bring them in and treat them. Um, so I had one patient who, you know, was on a liter of oxygen, really, really didn't want to be admitted. Um, so we sent her home on home oxygen and some and some medications. And like, I had to call her every single day to see how she was feeling. And she was getting progressively more short of breath at home, progressively more short of breath at home, to the point that she fainted while she was trying to take a shower. Um, and at that point, I said, you know what, like, it's not safe for you to be at home anymore, you have to come in. But she was terrified of taking up a bed and potentially taking those resources away from someone else. Um, and then incredibly feeling incredibly guilty that she even tested positive in the first place, having to have multiple uncomfortable phone calls with friends and people that she may have exposed. So I just think, you know, until you hear these stories of like what people are going through when they're living it and still living it, it's just hard to really understand like the, the depth and the breadth of the impact that this, that this infection and this disease is having on our society right now. Yeah, you know, I'm just reflecting as we kind of move into the final leg of this discussion. We've gone to many places and, you know, I, I, I keep thinking we've come here week in, week out. And I've actually asked the same question every single time. And it, it kind of stands tonight, too. And I'm going to direct this at Rayla, but happy to have um, any of the speakers jump in after, too. You know, like a lot of this was predictable. <laughs> These conversations, um, the tweets you were putting out, Ray Watt, the, the writing you were doing, the speaking, you know, you, you gave us your wish list well before. So we know what we, we need to do. We've actually tweeted that out um, if, uh, if you want to check out on HC in Canada. Um, but why weren't people listening? Why weren't the policymakers listening? Why wasn't the government listening? And actually, um, I think Ray Watt was, was bumped off. So I'm actually going to direct that question to Callie. Um, why weren't they listening? Ooh, thanks for giving me the really hard question. Um, Sorry. I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think they were listening. I think they've struggled with the potential policy implications of doing what they needed to do. And I think one of the biggest flaws of their response so far has been they've dis the decisions and the, the triggers to enact further public health measures have been based on healthcare capacity. And if you're making decisions based on the number of ICU and hospital beds left, you're too late. Um, and the decisions needed to be made based on how much virus there is in your community. And you know, a COVID zero approach, I know we all talk about this, is like, it will never happen. It, it, had they done that, we would have been in much better shape and we would have avoided this third and potentially the fourth wave. I'm curious if anyone else uh, wants to jump in here. Um, why do you think our leaders aren't listening to us? Uh, listening to experts, um, experts like the ones that we have in the room today or advocates. I mean, I think it's an, in, this is Seema, I think it's an, it was a bit of an inconvenient truth, I think. Um, I think that they, they were listening, but they were also listening um, to others. And they have lots of competing interests and lots of, of people that they have to please. Um, and I think that there has all along from the very beginning um, this notion that in order to control the pandemic, you have to sacrifice the economy and that you have to pick one over the other. And the reality is, is that, you know, if you don't have the pandemic under control, the economy doesn't have a hope in hell. <laughs> um, and sometimes you have to have the short term pain for long term gain. I think that's issue number one. And then issue number two, I just fundamentally disagree with this logic. But this is how, you know, policy has been moved forward is that, you know, if you are willing to double our ICU capacity, but you're not willing to provide essential workers paid sick leave, I mean, then, then this is going to continue to go on. I mean, you have to actually not just, like, you have to put up a fence before you go over the cliff. You can't, like, you know, put a little net at the end of the cliff and hope that that's going to be enough. Um, and, I mean, we're, you know, headed towards that cliff pretty quickly. Um, and uh, I, I'm worried. You know, 
paid sick leave. Like, I don't think we can have this discussion here tonight without actually addressing paid sick leave. Such an important point. Um, and Birgit, I know you've done a lot of advocacy on this front. Could you talk to us about why paid sick leave is so incredibly important? And can you maybe also give us some, you know, thoughts as to why we're still arguing about paid sick leave 15 months into a global pandemic? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just want to say they are they are not listening. They're not listening to the right people. Um, for years, the RNAO has been pleading with the government to stop RN replacement, and they never listened to that. RNs were replaced. Um, RNs were laid off, and that's why we are where we are right now. So that aside, um, paid sick leave is fundamental to fight to fighting this pandemic there are people going to work sick people are still going to work sick as of today people will go to work sick because a lot is at stake for them i have uh you know friends who work in factories i have friends who work as psws your sole support parents you know they have a family to feed, do you think they're going to ever stay home with a symptom? No. So one way to help healthcare workers in this crisis is to offer paid sick leave to these people. I think it's cheaper in the long run because our ICU now is at capacity. We're spending millions of dollars building field hospitals. For what? There, there's nobody to stop these hospitals. Unfortunately, our racialized population are, you know, they're most affected. And I think that's why we're not seeing paid sick leave. The people that matter, in quotes, air quotes, in the society are not as affected as the people that air quotes don't matter. And that is why we haven't seen paid sick leave. Because I do not understand how I am a nurse. I'm working in ICU and I get sick and I, I don't get paid sick leave. How is that even possible? So how do you expect me to isolate without pay and how do you expect me to be honest enough to let my employer know that i'm i have symptoms the next time why to lose my house or to just be unable to feed my family so it is so fundamental to fighting this virus look at amazon look at all these places canada post most of the people working there they're immigrants they're racialized um, community they have no paid sick leave and they'll keep going to work because they have they, they need a roof over their head. So it's fundamental. There's no way around this. Absolutely not. I, I could talk about paid sick leave forever. Thank you so much, Birkett. I, I, I want to um, bring in Seema here because, you know, the other piece here is vaccine equity. Like, I, I think the big thing here is how do we inspire change? What are changes that we can enact now to save our healthcare system? Seema, you, you talked about vaccine equity earlier. Uh, you know, what will this look like to you? Practically speaking, what do we do next to make this a reality? I mean, the first step is if you're going to prioritize communities that have unprecedented spread, which are, as Bergen mentioned, often more racialized communities with high degrees of essential workers and multi-generational homes, that means that some places will have to get more vaccine and other places will have to get less. And, you know, how can we prioritize, you know, vaccinating these communities unless we have a clear logistic plan in place to give these communities the amount of vaccine they need. They need these clear supply chains so that they can actually start to vaccinate the people that really need it. The second thing is we need community-based vaccination approaches. I mean, you know, to date, we've focused a bit more on mass clinics and hospital-based distribution, and the vaccines go to these hospitals, but, you know, the hospitals don't really get any more funding or logistics or plans about how to actually distribute these vaccines amongst all the vulnerable populations, so they're left to their own devices, and as a result, everybody's doing things a little bit differently, and the result of that is it is incredibly confusing. I mean, to look up what postal code you're in and then what clinic you have to go to and then how to get there and what date you have to log on to what online system. I mean, you've already lost me. 
So I don't even know how we expect the majority of other people to be able to follow that. So we need to simplify, simplify, simplify. And the other thing is that if you are high risk, living in a high risk community, you should be able to get vaccinated wherever the heck you can get in if the supply and logistics have not been sorted out or organized. So what we're doing is we're making people wait longer in areas where um, you know, the need is higher. And then in places where the need is a little bit lower, you know, they're able to vaccinate people a bit more quickly. It's just deeply inequitable. So I think what we need to answer your question is we need transparency. We need a clear logistics plan that is community based that involves giving more vaccines to the places that need them more. And then we need to involve those communities to say, how best can we vaccinate your population. Um, we had learned, Sabina and I, in some, in some telephone calls that, you know, people living in Rexdale, you know, the, the site that was tasked with vaccinating them was St. Joe's. I mean, there's no way for someone to transit from Rexdale to St. Joe's. What does that mean? Nobody from Rexdale is booking their vaccine at St. Joe's. So even though on paper that postal code is listed for that site, those people aren't getting vaccinated. And so, you know, I think it's time to not just, you know, increase eligibility. It's time to think about structural barriers and community access. And we need to do it like yesterday. Super powerful, Seema. Thank you so much. Um, Raywat, we were having some technical issues. You're back on. Good to have you back. You know, you're a communicator. You communicate the numbers. You're communicating the science of what's happening. What advice do you have for folks who are in the room who are communicators about the numbers, the epidemiology around COVID-19? How do we formulate our messaging so that we have a, a we can we can impact the public, but also perhaps convince our policymakers and our governments to do better? Analogies. People don't understand numbers. Numbers are processed through the front of your brain. We need stories and narratives that are processed through our limbic systems, through our reptilian hind brains that you feel in your gut. Analogies work. You know, um, I, I'm using the analogy of uh, the, the action movie. We're in the third act of the action movie when you fight the biggest foe. All that sort of. You probably heard me say this a, a number of times. So the fight is almost over. We're going to get through this this year. But we have this final big boss to battle, and it's an enormous boss. And oftentimes that final boss is the hardest one because the hero is the most tired, as we are. So getting away from the numbers is important. People, their eyes glaze over. What we want to hear about is what exactly does it mean to me? What do I need to do? And how do you make it as easy for me as possible to do the least amount? <laughs> right? So early on, we asked people, stay home and watch TV. That's how you're heroic. That's not good enough anymore. Now you've got to um, actively avoid other people. Now you have to stay put and persevere through some economic hardship. And now as well, there's an exit strategy. So what's been missing uh, up till now in the messaging is uh, this is not an interminable exercise. Now the end is in sight. And so a time frame can be given. We're asking people to, you know, to persevere for a certain number of weeks or months and to visualize a summer that has a ramp to normality that will never be left once we start that process because vaccinations have given us an exit. So having um, you know, uh, an exit plan, a dawn to be looked forward to, and analogies to understand exactly what narrative, what, uh, what metaphor, what aspect of my childhood stories can I draw upon to understand this deep in my limbic system. That's my poorly phrased advice. Oh my God, I loved that. What I wanna do is I wanna ask each of our panelists to think about this closing question. And I'll go one by one asking each of you, if you had one message to share with government decision makers, what would that be? But I'm going to ask you to keep it to the max three sentences. What message do you want to share with government? And I'll start with Callie, if I may. It's time to prioritize human lives over the economy. We can rebuild our economy, but when you're dead, you're gone forever. Wow. Thank you for that. Wait, what? Sorry, Mike was off. I would say, do not waste this opportunity to leverage public sentiment. To do what? To improve our healthcare system, to expand capacity, and to reinvest in overall science literacy. We get one shot at this and the window is closing. It's a race against time, honestly. Thank you for that. Birgit? So Birgit is having some technical issues. Um, so she texted me and said her answer to this question is formulated in four words. Implement paid sick leave. 
thank you for that. And last but not least, of course, Seema. Oh, God, the last words. <laughs> um, you know, we just published this piece on, on healthy debate about the ethics of this pandemic, and a sentence struck out to me, so I'm going to end with that. Society's failure to address upstream causes of ill health and inequities means that the futility or efficacy of ICU care is often determined well before people are brought through the doors of the hospital. I think that rings true for, for many aspects um, of this pandemic. That is an amazing line to end on. Remember that if you follow at HC in Canada, um, you'll be able to keep up to date with all of our weekly sessions. Um, we are trying to get at the core of the pressing issues that are impacting Canadian healthcare so we can give people perspective and commentary right from the experts. And with that, thank you guys so much for joining us for another amazing session today. Thanks again.